All right. Hello and welcome back to the Generative Landscape discussion series. I'm really excited to be joined here today with Jason Antic. Jason is a deep learning researcher. You might know his work Deoldify, which colorizes and restores old photos and is used by hundreds of thousands of people um, to bring life back to these old documented memories. Um, so he's here today to talk with us about that and then also just go through some of our philosophies around experimentation and so on. Um, so Jason, really nice to, to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, as always, I, I like to start these out with um, a bit of a background on how you came into the space. So do you maybe want to tell us just a little bit what brought you into deep learning? Like when did you get into this and what was your sort of journey? Yeah, um, so I started out as a software engineer. I, that's what I studied in college, computer science. And yeah, you know, that was like 20 years ago. So that kind of dates me. But uh, even back then, I was kind of vaguely interested in AI. But of course, back then, it just didn't work very well. And you couldn't do nearly as many interesting things with it. Uh, they were talking about like expert systems and stuff like that at the time. Uh, neural networks, uh, I actually thought were quite interesting. But Nobody thought they were cool at the time. So, uh, you know, I kept that in the back of my head. Uh, and then 2012 came around and the image, ImageNet competition where uh, AlexNet was introduced and it blew away all the other competitors. Uh, and that was Neural Network. And that caught my attention. So I, I started to try to learn this stuff because it was like, cool, maybe you can actually do stuff with this now. Um, and I failed repeatedly. <laughs> To, to, to get into it because I just couldn't find a course that um, uh, that I that I felt was I could learn from I guess um, and then so that was like many years of that and then finally I came across uh, Jeremy Howard's Fast AI course back in I think it was 2016 or 2017 um, took that and uh, I was still working and you know I I loved it. And I was just like, man, if I just had more time, then I could really get into this. So that's what I wound up doing. I I I, plan I actually was so convinced that this is the way. So I I I planned to save up enough money so that you know a year later I could um, go part time and then just really dive deep into this stuff in the, to the new fast AI course. And uh, so that's what I did. And uh, I don't regret it one bit. And uh, so to tell you, you know, to illustrate how effective these courses are, um, in May of 2018, that's when I started. And then um, by the end of summer, like August, I was done the courses and I decided to do a capstone project. And I was like, I had like a dozen ideas. And I was like, hmm, colorization of images might be a cool thing to do. And I had like a vague idea that I could like somehow get a GAN to work with this. Uh, but in a weird way that I wasn't seen talked about. So I, I just basically hammered away at it for six weeks and then uh, put it on GitHub. It worked uh, and it went viral after that. And, that. and ever since, it kind of took over my life, basically. And I made a business out of it. Right, right. And I'm, I'm really excited to like dig into you know how you solved that problem and how that changed over time. Um, but I know, so when I started, I'd done... I think like you, you know, I'd been interested in the space and trying to get things working in 2013 didn't work for me, trying to get things going a little bit later. Um, but the first time I properly ran through like the whole fast AI course, it must have been the 2019 course. And um, so that's when I first heard about this guy, Jason Antich, which is how Jeremy pronounces it, um, because it was like the student, this past student <laughs> of fast AI, look at this amazing project. You know, it was like one of the big examples of like, if you take this course, you'll be doing really cool stuff. And like the epitome of really cool stuff was this deoldify thing. Um, so that was really fun. And that was, I mean, that course really moved me from like deep learning curious, but mostly like traditional data science into like, okay, this deep learning thing is yeah really powerful and really cool. Um, so I guess I partly thank you for that, for being the, the example held up. Um, so yeah, I think that, cool. I think that deoldify project is a really nice case study as to, you know, like this course that, that, this recordings for and things is going to be very much like little small little demos, fun little projects. Um, whereas the Oldify, like you mentioned, you started working on that in, in 2018, 2019. This has now become like a full career. It's a full, you know, massive tool. You've, you know, used it yourself and then it's become a business and t it's now incorporated into my heritage. Um, so yeah, maybe do you want to talk through like, first of all, what the problem looks like and why it's interesting. 
Um, and then maybe if you can, just a little bit of the iteration over the years as to how you've, you know, taken it from that first proof of concept two weeks after the course to maybe something closer to what the open source version looks like today or what the library does currently. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess I'll define the problem first and why it's a hard problem. Um, so colorization, basically, once you turn a image into a black and white image, going back to a color image, you have multiple solutions for that because many things can map to the same grayscale. So it's it's an undefined problem, basically. And uh, that's a particularly, or, you know, nowadays it's kind of changed. That's why I've gotten into this diffusion models stuff recently because I'm it's really changed the game on this. But back then, uh, that used to be a really hard problem because uh, it was really hard to get a neural network to decide to, to use a natural color as opposed to just pick something that will fit the score that you're assigning to it but isn't really what you actually want. It's really hard to actually define like a proper scoring function as to whether or not a photo was colorized properly or not. And one of the you know, promising solutions at the time that I saw was uh, GANs because um, they kind of figured that out for you. I mean, the way I framed it was that they figured out the loss function of the score for you. Um, and it worked. Um, not perfectly, but it worked. And, and, and so that, you know, the proof of concept there took six weeks. Now, I say proof of concept because it's one thing to have, like, you know, something that kind of works. But then when you're like me and you're like, you want to perfect it, um, that's a whole other ball game. And I, and, I, and I knew that going in. I remember I even wrote it on the GitHub repo. I was like, now my ambition is to actually make this well, but I know this is going to take a lot longer. Uh, and, and indeed, like it's at last, what do you want to call it, like 20% or whatever, that's 80% of the time or actually probably last 10%, it's 90% of the time, honestly. So... Yeah, you, yeah. I'll let you uh, ask more specific questions on that from there. Yeah. So maybe um, you mentioned the the loss function, and so for some people they might think, well, I can generate the training data, right? Because I can take RGB images, I can turn them into grayscale, and then I can set the target as the colored image. Um, so why can't you just use something like mean squared error to say, well, give it in the the grayscale image, it outputs a three channel image. I take the difference between that and the true one. Um, you know, why doesn't that work to give us good colors? So the way I like to explain this problem is that, you know, basically you got to be really careful about how you're actually measuring what success is and what failure is. Um, I like to use the phrase, you know, if you have a stupid measure, you're going to get stupid results. And it's obvious that the measures or the metric is, is stupid in the first place. But, you know, I'll just explain it a little bit further here, right? So um basically like i said earlier a black and white image uh can be different uh potential uh colors right um it, it's an undefined problem now if you just take a mean square error any of those three channels can be in various configurations to match what you're asking of it effectively uh so the best strategy for the model then is to minimize the distance from those pixels by giving it the most average value possible, which is brown or, you know. Right. And, so, and so if you actually run... Sorry, just to check my understanding. What's so that? If I see a, a gray shirt in the grayscale, right? So it's some sort of lightish color, but it's, I'm not sure what. It could be red. It could be green or blue. Um, and so I could guess close to one of those, but then I'd be really far from the others and I'd get a big squared error, and so I get a big penalty. Whereas if I guess a sort of average color, which is purpley brown, even though no real shirts look like that, my mean squared error is going to be lower. Is, is that the sort of right idea? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a very naive way of measuring success, and it's also a very cheatable way of measuring success. Um, so what you'll actually see uh, in practice, if you do mean squared error, or L1, or you know any of those any of those measures that you're just looking at the distance between the pixels basically uh you're going to get blue skies green because you know green grass and green trees because they're always green you know those 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 will do fine skin will do fine but 
if you're going to start looking at things like clothing or cards and whatnot, uh, it's just going to throw its hands up and be like, eh, brown, because um, at least brown or, or gray or whatever um, will minimize. It's, it's basically hedging its bets. It's like, okay, well, I don't know which color it is, but if I put all my bets in all three channels here a little bit, then I'll minimize my error. Because that's, that's what mm. you're scoring, right? right? So um, that, that's a dead end. You don't want to do that basically <laughs> cool and this is i mean this is a problem that goes for all sorts of things right i know super resolution um you want sharp details but if you train with just mean squared error if it's not sure of those details you'll get a blurry result same thing with diffusion models yeah. if you try yeah, to do exactly. the step and so on and so forth okay so it's good to know that like you need to think a little bit more about what that loss function looks like um and so if msc and, and l1 and so on aren't good enough um, what then is your solution? So like you started with this thing, you've tried it with MSC, it's all you know brown and blue. Um, so you said GAN was the first big idea um, and that's working because the other network knows that most shirts aren't brown, right? So it's going to look real if it forces it to pick one of those more common colors. Um, if the whole shirt is the same color, that's going to be more plausible than mottled or something. Um, so... So I, I'm guessing that's one approach. Are there other things that you do? Like I know you've done some very clever loss function engineering over time. Um, so what else? What are some other tricks besides just having a, a discriminator in the mix that help with that? Well, yeah. So the, first of all, the problem with GANs, um, and this is this is like very, very evident in the first very first version of the old fly, which you can find online, but it's kind of hard. Uh, it's not the one you see now. Uh, but the very first one was taking the GAN process from beginning to end. Uh, and that introduced a lot of instability in the process. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you're getting interesting colors, but you're also getting craziness, right? Just like blobs of colors that really did not belong there. Uh, so that was like the next problem to tackle basically for the next version of the Olify. And so my head went straight to like, okay, how do we, make this scan process um, a lot more sane. And what wound up being the answer at the time was, well, basically, you want to scan as much as possible. So that's that's what I wound up calling. Actually, Jeremy Howard came up with this name, uh, NoGAN. And the essence of it is that you can use a traditional uh, techniques that we learned and fast everybody learns in fast AI, which is to, uh, you know, rely on pre-training as much as possible. So, and in this case, you know, I, the way I've reframed the problem was, well, you can learn most of the stuff that needs to be learned, you know, as far as like, you know, the, the base colors, like, like I was describing earlier, like what, you know, the colors of trees should be in, in grass and people mm. and stuff like that. I'll get all this right. If, you know, even if you use MSE, Loss. I, I wound up using perceptual loss for that because um, it was doing a little bit better with a lot of stuff. I actually quite a bit better with a lot of stuff, uh, but not quite there with, you know, to the level where the GAN is. Um, so that gets you like most of the way there. And that's great. And then what the uh, what the GAN does then if you do it in a fine tuning uh, uh, approach is it very quickly. I mean, it, it doesn't take many steps. It's like uh, it's like 1500 steps. Um, so like 10 minutes mm. of this training, uh, that actual GAN training, uh, you'll see it light up into much, a much more colorful uh, image, like the photos it'll generate uh, before and after. Um, so that fine tuning approach, um, and it was very finicky, I got to be clear on that, because it's like you had to like cut it off at it exact moment before it went crazy <laughs> but if you found that exact moment just before it went crazy then you got the benefits without the the problems yeah okay cool so i i really like that approach i've, I've actually um i haven't seen it written up much anywhere in the literature but if you, especially if you've got some initial objective right like fixing an image somehow image restoration and then you're just using the gan part for that final bit and using some of the tricks like you know adaptive gan switching and and so on um, yeah, it's a really powerful approach. It's a really nice way of breaking it down. Um, I might try and include some content on that for this course so that people can see what we're talking about. 
Um, so I really like that. And, and so you did that and, and lots of other experiments, I'm sure. You've ended up with this better model um, that's now in production. So any particular insights in terms of like, it works on my machine and you know I, it runs fast enough to like make a few demo images for the blog post up to like this can process, you know, thousands of images a day at high velocity. What, what does that like deployment process look like? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, first of all, I, you know, I'll say this, um, you know, I, you can't do it all. So, I, you know, I, I, I've always been fo- over the years focusing on uh, strictly making a better model. Now there's a lot to that. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, I do have an eye towards production in terms of like how fast is this model? How, uh, much memory is it taking? Am I taking advantage of like, you know, uh, the jet, you know, and, and all these other things you can do to make it faster and more efficient, you know, to, to run on production practically. Uh, but luckily we had my heritage to like just offload the actual, you know, details there. So I didn't really have, to, so I can't really speak to like, you know, infrastructure and stuff like that and how, how you make it distributed. But uh yeah as far as like going from the the open source to something that weren't running on production uh you know basically uh that's where you know that's where a combination of the software engineering skills i learned over the years came became really useful uh but also more importantly just uh kind of kind of like approaching the problem from the standpoint of uh don't assume that everything, any, anything that um, you've been working on to this point is optimal, uh, whether it's from yourself or from others. Mm. Um, you know, myself, because I make mistakes all the time, of course, but uh, but all this stuff is coming from, like, like you know, we're using, like, these pre-trained models from academia. And, you know, when you read about, uh, you know, how, how to make a unit, it's from academia, a lot. I mean, not everything from academia, but but it's a lot of academia-minded people, uh, or it's from Google and Facebook, and and they have these big computers to run these things on. And basically, I mean, if you really think about it, no, not a lot of people really actually have the kind of problem that that you have, right? When you're trying to make something uh, practical, like these papers are coming from people that are um, interested in other things. They're not wrong things. They're just they're not your problems. So they're not really as worried as I am about making it memory efficient and fast. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it just, it, it turned out there was like a, a lot of low hanging fruit. You just had to, you know, question a lot of things in the process. So yeah, I went, you know, we wound up cause we wound up making uh, a model, you know, I can give you the rough and a rough idea of how this runs. Like, It'll, it'll run on like six gigabytes of GPU RAM, but it's handling like, and then I'm talking not just about colorization, mm. but like, uh, you know, scratch removal and uh, color restoration. And we're, you know, we're talking about photos that are, you know, HD and whatnot, or, you know, you know, big, big mm. photos, yeah. right? So um, that, that can take up a lot of memory uh, in a unit architecture. So, uh there's a lot of that, a lot of questioning assumptions, a lot of, you know, just digging into the actual nuts and bolts and, you know, looking at each layer and being hypercritical about what's actually being done there. Um, but then it's just uh, a lot of uh, tenacity and a lot of being wrong and just pushing through that again and again. And I, I really just, like, in general, the whole research process is just, in my opinion, it's, it's, it involves a lot more uh emotional intelligence than anything else like I, <laughs> and having to deal with constant failure yeah yeah <sighs> so the reason i have jason yeah. on um so we've been working on a project together with you know jeremy and some of the other fast ai folks and trying to understand diffusion models um, and part of that was like what's a minimum viable product you know what works so we had a little demo i'd written up um if, if you're watching this coming from the course it's like lesson 12 right the intro to diffusion models what's the simplest possible thing um, and so I got to see Jason come in and like take this notebook and then like, quite quickly just run through probably like 30 versions up on GitHub now, if not more, um, doing exactly that process, right? What about this? Okay, that didn't seem to work as well. Okay, but what if I add 
Norm oh, okay, that makes an improvement. Okay, uh, if I add batch norm, okay, that makes an improvement. Okay, if I turn them into ResNet blocks in the unit, okay, that makes an improvement. If I try this, oh, that didn't work at all. But all of that, you know, is like, yeah, it's, I think, I think when you read a paper or something, right, you say, here's this idea, and here's our final architecture, and it works, right? And maybe there's an ablation yeah. study or two that says why it works better than some other alternative. But what you're saying is exactly right. The actual process, you know, is trying hundreds of things, right? Lots of failed runs, lots of, you know, little rabbit holes. And just having that, like, yeah, like you're saying, intuition and exploration mindset of, well, if it doesn't work, that's fine. Um, but Jason's probably brought up like three revelations already of like, hey, why don't we do it this way? And then sure enough, like makes a big improvement. Um, yeah, so it's been really fun to watch you work. And I'm guessing that that's your approach, you know, to research generally. Yeah, there's, there's a few things to dissect there, what you just said. I'm glad you brought all this up. Um, so first of all, yeah, I mean, I, there, there's there's the importance of doing one thing at a time, mm -hmm. not a whole bunch of things. That's a discipline too. I mean, I, I, I gotta admit, like sometimes I, I, I definitely break that discipline, but yeah, that's a really important thing to do, honestly. But a uh, second thing there is you gotta be really skeptical about what you're seeing, the state of mind you're in. Cause you know, especially with like, uh, like, cause, cause ultimately when, when you're trying to evaluate your models, uh, I, I've always had to rely on my eyes. Uh, that's a tricky subject too. Cause it's like, uh, you gotta be really careful about your own perception. Like sometimes if you're, if you're in a bad mood, for example, you'll be like, Oh yeah, this totally sucks. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, and sometimes you gotta just recognize that, you, you know, you're just not seeing things straight. You know, you're seeing what you want to see, or you're focusing on, on, on one thing, but not the other. And it could be a really crazy game of chasing your own tail. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at with the whole, emotional intelligence thing mm. too it's like yeah. how, how do you manage this because again i i have to emphasize you, you know you can't uh you can't really even rely on like fid or any of these other metrics to like um tell you if if something actually looks good to the human eye mm. the, those things will always wind up missing stuff it's it's, it's, a, it's not a reliable thing to do and plus you know like if you're going to do a lot of these metrics these these more sophisticated ones are going to take forever to run so um if you're you know, you need to iterate quickly, and so your eyes are actually probably your best, better overall. So what I'm arriving at here too is, uh, as as you're alluding to, uh, you know, I got through a lot of these iterations. Um, now I I haven't actually reported all the mistakes I've made along the way too, because I, I I was like I figured it just cluttered the uh, the GitHub, and I didn't want to tell you everything on on that. Twitter chat. I was already clogging the Twitter chat with all these, you know, new findings and whatnot. So, um, and that's kind of like uh, more generally how it works in the ecosystem. I mean, that's basically the scientific ecosystem is that we're, uh, you know, encouraged to only publish positive results and not negative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, kind of, I, I do kind of think it obscures this whole process, um, but also probably creates a lot of uh, waste in terms of like people repeating mistakes over and over again yeah <laughs> but yeah that's that i'm not saying i'm typical i don't know i i'm I, you know i don't work with other scientists but that's how it works for me i i you know basically i kind of like to think of it as like you know kind of the same way that stochastic gradient descent is actually a pretty dumb process but it leads you to a great result right yeah um it's kind of like what i do Right, mm. like you just <laughs> so the gradient is empiricism, right? The, the signals the real world is giving you. Now the thing is, this 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 is the hard part. You actually have to recognize, you know, what the data is telling you, and you have to acknowledge it. And you have to so again, you have to acknowledge constantly that you're wrong, uh, or your pet theory mm. is not panning out, or you know, or what you're working on is suboptimal. Like you know, when the fusion models come out, I'm like. Yeah, it's time to move on from what I was doing, right? <laughs> or yeah, before that it was it was uh, GANs, right? Like uh, I, I actually really thought GANs were awesome for a while, but then I, you know, had to read the evidence. I was like, well, uh, they're a real big pain in the butt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I like I like the theory. I like the theory that they learned the loss function from me. I really want that to work and practice, but like you know, I. I just keep running into dead ends on this and you know maybe it's 
time to cut my losses and move on. So, yeah. well, there's a humility to that, right? Like, I think some people are like, well, I'm an expert at transformers. So I don't want to touch this new thing because I'm not an expert at diffusion models. Or I'm not an expert at whatever the next thing is. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like back to that, it's, it's you, you, you hit it, the hit the nail on the head, but the emotional intelligence part, it's saying like, well, you know, just because I've got this like sunk cost doesn't mean that there's not a better solution. And so, yeah, might as well start, start yeah, going there. You really, you really think about it. I mean, like there, there's a lot of perverse incentives to not do the right thing from a scientific mm. or research standpoint. Um, and it, it's either, whether it's uh, ego, right? Like what I, I, I keep talking about, but see, the thing is, is that I, in a lot of ways, I got a lot of uh, advantages here as a ind independent researcher uh, because I'm just working for myself. And uh, I don't have some higher up telling me, well, this is where the money is, so research this, right? Yeah. Or I don't have my peers yeah. You know, tell, tell me that my paper can't be published cause, because it's not considered a, a, a publishable thing, I guess, or whatever. Like, because I, I remember Jeffrey Hinton was talking about uh, neural nets back, like, uh, before they were cool, back before 2012, basically. And he said, yeah, they, they used to really struggle even getting a paper published, which I just think is crazy, right? Yeah. Um, but, that, but that's actually how a lot of this stuff works. There's just a lot of... Uh, you know, whether it's uh, on the individual level or on the social level, the economic level and so on, there's a lot of incentives to make bad decisions and not follow the evidence. And so that's that's a battle you have to fight constantly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. So uh, maybe just to recap, like a few of the, the key the key ideas here. Um, I think one we're saying like the the single like smooth path to the final result never happens, right? Um, and and you can you can see I've I've noticed yeah my weights and biases report or, or whatever you know there's like two two experiments presented but the automatic numbering is like number fifty seven and number eighty seven you know um, so yeah I think you're definitely not the only one everyone I know has you know ten times as many little things that they try and it fails for one reason or another so. Yeah, acknowledging that, that you're going to make lots of mistakes and that it's worth just trying lots of things. Um, having like a fast iteration cycle you mentioned so that you can try more of these experiments, really, really key. Yeah. I think for someone like you who's been doing doing this kind of work for a number of years, you've got this advantage of like an intuition, right? Like, oh, I'm looking at this loss curve and it looks good or I'm looking at this image and it looks yeah. bad in a way that I've seen before. Um, so I guess practice. I actually, that's... That's crucial. Yeah, actually, honestly, you know, I think that what I that that that's actually been like up front when I, even when I first got into this stuff, uh, I knew enough up to that point to really appreciate how important it is to have uh, good intuitions about things because it's that's how you fluidly think about things. I mean, like you know, for example, like when you know you wouldn't want to be driving a car. You know, having to calculate the exact angle that you're—I mean, that's what happens when you're when you're first learning, mm. and it sucks, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. But eventually, uh, you want this stuff to, to come naturally, and you want to have—you know—you want to be thinking about bigger, better things, right? So um, that's te that, yeah, that's te how I like to think of this stuff—is like um, not in a mathy sense, maybe maybe intuitions that somehow come from the math, but. You know, ultimately, it's uh, figuring out okay, what what's the essential idea here, and uh, how can I apply it practically? And you know, think about it not in a mathy sense, but like kind of like I got these Lego blocks, mm. and I want to see how they work together. You know, um, and, and I'd say you know, Jeremy Howard's a really good uh, teacher to to arrive at those intuitions much quicker than you would otherwise. And I'll make sure that the the link to that fast AI course is, is in the, yeah, in the show notes. Yeah, please do. That's a good one to check out. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Jason. That's been really good to pick your brain and, and see some of this kind of behind the scenes insight into, yeah, what what a day it looks like or what it looks like to be doing, especially this kind of independent research in this deep learning field. Um, so really appreciate you coming on. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Um. Yeah, sign up uh, for the fast AI <laughs> course as soon as possible. I, you know, I think it'll change your life um, if you're at all remotely interested in this deep learning stuff. Uh, it's a great skill to have, but also I just think it's a revelation to have um, such a such a learning experience 
frankly, and, and the community is great. So please do that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we'll see you all in the next video. That's it for now.